Right, thank you. So uh, this session, we are very delighted to have a wonderful lady who's been with us the entire time we've been planning these courses. Um, I'm going to let her introduce herself, but before we uh, go to Rosemarie, I'm going to remind you that we do encourage comments, we do encourage questions, but we'd like them put into the chat, please. And once they're in there, um, if we would like to bring you in and to ask your question, we can. If you prefer that you didn't ask it yourself or publicly ask the question, then please do post it to me privately and I will be able to have a look at it and bring it in if that's appropriate. We understand this is a very sensitive area. Um, following last week's conversation, I did have an interesting email from someone present in the group who did point out that we jumped in last week without a huge discuss discussion about what how racism might be understood, uh, how you might define it and what it might mean. Um, my response to that is I think it's really important that we do have that discussion, but these are discussions to support the course that's already looking at that stuff. What we will do is I'm going to work with um, Graham, who emailed me, and I'm very grateful to him, to set up a further session later on for those who really would like a more intensive look at what race how it can be defined, where it's come from, what racism is, whatever it is that Graham advised me, advises me that he thinks that we need based on what he's seen in this session. So um, if that's of interest to you, then please do let me know because this is an ongoing conversation and people are starting in many, many different places. So Graham, I'm really grateful to you for getting in touch. Thank you. That was kind of you. Right. So, uh, Rosemary, over to you. Good evening. Can you all hear me? Great, so the wife is behaving herself. This is great, all good news, great to start. So my name is Rosemary Davidson Gotterbed. I am uh, currently the National Minority Ethnic Vocations Officer, which means that I am a resource to dioceses such as yourselves across the country as uh, they consider how to encourage um, and nurture and resource um, vocations among people of Black, Asian and minority ethnic heritage. And uh, just basically a company and to de deliver, develop and resources that will enable that. Um, and, along, and alongside that for dioceses that say, well, we don't actually have a, 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 a sizable number of people of Black, Asian, minority ethnic heritage in our churches, then the question is then how are you preparing for that eventuality? How are you preparing to be the, that pe those people, to welcome folk, uh, to welcome a, a clergy person who would, may not be of the same ethnicity as you? So that's me in broad brushstrokes. Um, today, we are going to uh, consider um, my, my title, which is The Future is Bright? Question mark. And um, how I tend to do these kind of seminars is to ask questions, which are for you to then write down if you wish to, or if you've got an extraordinary, brilliant memory, uh, keep it in your head. I have a memory of a goldfish, so I write everything down. Um, and just and to illustrate that question with um, anecdotal stories or, or maybe another, maybe asking the question in a different way. So it's not a traditional lecture, if that's what you're used to. Um, uh, it's more conversational, but for the moment, one-sided while you get an opportunity to mull over the questions and, and maybe even come back with your own thoughts and reflections. So I'm hoping that this is very much an interactive time together. And um, can I just say that um, to reiterate certainly what was said to me, that this is a safe space for you to, to, to make the statements you wish to make and that there is really no such thing as a silly question. If you can't ask it here, yeah, you're gonna struggle asking it elsewhere. Um, use me while I can, and if I can't answer your question, um, I generally know an extraordinarily clever person who, who can, and I'll put you in touch with him or her. So uh, are we ready to go? So the future is bright, question mark. Um, 
for those of us who are old enough to remember, that was uh, that was part, part without the question mark. It was part of the advertising campaign of a phone company that doesn't exist anymore called Orange. And um, I and it was and the, uh, the the strap line, as I remember, the future is bright. The future is orange. And um, and it was quite. It's one of those things that stick in your head. But sort of fast forward uh, a few years, and another television or advertising campaign, where uh, well, of a program called Orange is the New Black. And so once I said at a at a conference, the future is bright, the future is orange, and someone said from the audience, and orange is the new black. So, yeah, yeah, I, I mixed in, in intelligent circles, but they've got a sense of humour. Um, <laughs> it doesn't always match up. Um, and it's probably evidence of me watching too much television or being deeply influenced by, uh, by clever marketing. But we have to grapple with this thing of the future being bright. And the Bible, when we look at the future, we're thinking of our heavenly future. And the Bible gives us um, vivid and various images of what heaven is like. Of course, we know the Revelation 7 piece that you would already um, reflected on. Excuse me. <clears throat> and it sounds, it sounds amazing, the various images of heaven you know no more tears no more wars or rumors of wars every tribe and every tongue it just sounds all too much to contain and the list goes on but my question that i ask is do you really want this or do you want the heaven that maintains your advantage, your ethnic advantage, your class advantage, your gender advantage, your educational advantage, your professional advantage, or any combination of the above? Especially if we've been made aware of that advantage. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I, I observe about scientists is that they have a theory and they, in order to prove that theory, they test it. And sometimes their theory doesn't match up with the results. The theory doesn't always match up with the results. What's your theory about what you want? Is this the heaven that you want? What is your theory? And as your life, your experiments, as it were, does that prove that theory? Is this the heaven that you want? When I lived in the States for a few years, I was fortunate enough to work with the Episcopal Diocese of Boston and the Episcopal Divinity School in, in Cambridge. Um, and I got involved with them as they um, rolled out the Seeing the Face of God in Each Other resource, which is a six week piece of work um, uh, where people consider what it means to seeing the face of God in each other. So it's very much an anti-racism, cross-cultural understanding piece of resource. And I, I trained to deliver that work um, among, among that team. One of the privileges of doing this kind of work is that you meet all kinds of people, but you never quite know what you're going to get. And it's never quite predictable what's going to land. And then what comes up, what is thrown up from that landing. 
So my responsibility in this group was to lead a Bible study. And this particular Bible study is a little different. Some of you may be, um, uh, may be aware of this or, or experience this before and others may not, but it's pretty much like this. I have a Bible verse in various different versions. So King James, the message, whatever, about three. Three is usually a good number, nice and holy, Trinity and all that. And I get somebody to read the Bible verse and we have a period of silence while we let those words sink in. And then there's a period where people speak the word or the phrase that has impacted them. And then we do it again with another version of that, of that verse and repeat the same process. In this particular <clears throat> session, we did the Revelation 7 verse nine. And the partner of the vicar of this particular church, amazing person, really frighteningly bright in many ways, um, was astoundingly honest. And they said, after the third reading, I don't actually know that I am actually comfortable with that. I don't actually know that I'm comfortable with that. And you could have heard a fly cough in that room. But I reason that I honor her and I just hugged her was that for me as a person of color in a church setting has been the first time I have heard something so profoundly honest. The first time I have to wait until I'm in my mid thirties before I hear that. And why was it profound? It was profound because she felt safe. We, we established that we were there to learn and that people were going to take responsibility for themselves, that they were not going to speak on behalf of others. You know the conversation. Well, some people feel and some people think and that kind of, cowardice hiding behind. We insisted that people used I statements, um, which meant that people who usually do this, did this. But it told a truth, not that she didn't want it, but she wasn't sure that it made her, that she was comfortable with it. And here is a woman who has lived a very privileged life in America. Uh, and we, we've been made very aware of the race relations, if you can call it that, in America, um, that have been going on since the founding of the country. But I honor her because she was honest, she wasn't sure. And what she signaled was, I, I am on a journey. And the reality of this verse has just hit me. Do I really want this? Am I there yet? So my question is, given where you are at the moment and the future being Rev's Revelation 7, 9. Do you really want that? And what will that mean for you 
in your circumstances? What, not just what will you gain, but what will you have to let go of? What will you have to let go of to gain that future? One of the questions that uh, you, I realize, I understand you are thinking about, excuse me, <coughs> is what was Jesus like? And um, for me in my teens and um, early twenties growing up, there was a, a, a very strong ongoing conversation of more about what Jesus looked like. Was he white? Was he black? Was he, you know, blonde hair, blue eye? Did he look Middle Eastern and whatever? But sort of wrestling with the concept, given that most of us would have grown up in a house, in a Caribbean home with a very large picture of a, of a white blonde haired Jesus looking down, holding his hand up like this in, in blessed. And that was, that was like an indication, this is a Christian home. You are walking into a Christian home. And it was what was available. So no one ever thought it was anything negative. And so the conversations that sort of said, is this, is this even right? was almost like heresy for people of my parents' generation. You know, well, what, does it, what does it matter? Well, it matters enough for you to put the picture up. And so there were a lot of those toing and froing conversations. And one of the, for me growing up and for a lot of my contemporaries at the time, the who Jesus, who is Jesus and what, what was his like? We struggled with the idea that Jesus wasn't, that we struggled with the idea that Jesus wasn't white. Necessarily for the reason that you think. For us, growing up, listening to the stories of Jesus, Jesus as a, as a boy in the temple, speaking to the elders, being missing for three days and his parents having to come back and fetch him and his response. And then later on, older, his first miracle and his mum coming up to him and saying, oh, you know, what's going to happen? And his response. That for us, put it very clearly, Jesus cannot be anything other than white because all we knew was only white people talk to their parents like that and live. <laughs> no one we knew would say, woman, what am I to do with you? Unless they were suicidal. <laughs> no one would even go dare to go missing for three days. The amount of anger built up in the time to go and fetch him from the temple was, was, it was just, our heads were like, wow, there is no way. Because if he was anything like my auntie, my grandmother, my mom, my dad, my parents would take turns beating him. You know, it was, it was, it was just too much. Just the cultural idea of what Jesus was like was something that was very, very prevalent in our lives. But there was also something else that was part of our growing up as young Caribbeans. And some of you may be familiar with this phrase because we grew up with it all the time. Show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. My dad used to tell, say that to us all the time and it was a way of encouraging us to choose well. But then we read about Jesus's friends. And I know, and this may be the case for some of you, that if my friends were like Jesus's friends in terms of their background, their families, who they were, what they do, Jesus would not come through my front door. Who is his family? The man's walking up and down the street, always out on the street. Why is he never in his house? Those kinds of, those kinds of ideas. And, you know, we, we, 
And I would encourage you to think of the people who followed Jesus. Who were they? And where were they from? And what did they do? And would you follow somebody who sounded and looked like, who are the people who roam around our country now? Roma, Roma travelers? Would you follow a Roma traveler guy? Hang out with his friends? Based on my experience and observation of Jesus, were, our, were he on our streets today, he would still be executed. I've no doubt about that, no shadow of a doubt. He would still be executed. He'd probably even end up like George Floyd. Another question. How does our or your vision, how does your church match, match up with God's vision? How does your church, our church match up with God's vision? And what will you do or not do to balance the scales? How are you going to do that? One of the questions that was often asked of me <clears throat> in the wake of the public lynching of George Floyd, not a death, he didn't die quietly in his sleep. He was murdered on the streets and people stood and watched like they did in the, eight, the 90, early 1900s and 20s and 30s. Granted, this time there were no picnics and so on and so forth, but yes, he was murdered. And there were a lot of people who were saying, but, you know, there's such a groundswell of people who are just thrown up and shocked and horrified by what they saw on their phones and their laptops and their iPads and, and just horrific. And how could this happen? And people went out onto the streets and they protested and organizations put out their statements and, their, and the black box on some of the, uh, Facebook and, and Twitter accounts where people just put a, a black box and Black Lives Matter and, and the extraordinary irritating All Lives Matter. Yeah, and anyway, that's another conversation. But what was really intriguing to me was people would say, well, isn't this this groundswell? Isn't this sign of hope? And these were people who were about the same age as me. I'm 54. There are people who are a bit older than me. So, so they would have lived through the 70s. They would have, their parents would have been aware of the murder of Kelso Cochrane, which is why we have the Notting Hill Carnival. There would have been people who would have who would have been who would have been aware of the sus laws, and who would have been aware of the riots in the eighties, and the murder of of um, Stephen Lawrence in the nineties, and you know so each decade has its own George Floyd moment. And each decade throws up the same question. What can we do? 
And the other one, my <laughs> tell us your story. And I wonder what, for what purpose, how is it that the questions, these questions that were asked by my predecessors, those people who were doing the work of racism awareness, anti-racism, cross-cultural understanding before I stepped up to the cold face, how they were answering the same questions that I end up ask, answering in my 20s and still get asked in my 30s and then get asked again in my 40s. And now, 2020, 2021, in my 50s. What is it that we, the people of God, church, because we, were we weren't living on another planet when all of this has happened. It was right there. Everything that we know now was already in the public domain. How is it that you don't know, that you did not know, that you did not know what life was like for people your fellow citizens, men and women across the country, because it was all there in the public domain, on the news, in the papers, in Bible studies, in the church times, in other uh, Christian spaces, on premiere, when, when by the time premiere came onto the scene, so none of these issues are new. So why are we still asking the same questions? What is it about your journey, your experiences, your choices in what you choose to see and not see that brings you to a place where you are considered a competent functioning intelligent participant in human life and not know. Twenty twenty one, I predict, is going to be a very crucial point for us as a church as people of God, when I think say church, I mean the whole body, church body, regardless of denomination, those of us who claim Christ as our Lord and Savior. We have an issue of integrity coming over the hill that we will not be able to pray our way out of or dodge with being nice. It's going to be time for us to hand in our homework. Or as some of the young, younger people say, people are going to be asking you for your receipts. They're gonna to want to see the receipts. And they're going to ask you about stuff that you were required to do, that we were required to do at the point when we gave our life to Christ and became a professed Christian that so many of us haven't done through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We need to be aware and careful of two particular codependent sins. The sin of niceness and the sin of gradualism. This issue of racism has been with us for as long as it has because we tell ourselves these things take time. Where there is will, there is definitely a way.
we tell each other and we tell other Christians that when Christians get together and we pray for something, things happen. People's lives are transformed. Countries are transformed. Areas are transformed. Why has not this been transformed? And a personal question for yourself is what hand have you played in that lack of transformation? Is it silence? Is it excuses? Is it, it's nothing to do with me? Or is it about, well, we don't have people like that here. Or my favorite, we don't have a problem here. So right now, people who are oppressed are a problem. People who look different to you are now a problem. Right there is all the problem you need, your mind and where you're at. Being nice is not going to challenge racism, but being intentionally anti-racist will challenge racism. When you grasp at that intentionality, you stand a better chance of grasping the heaven of Revelation 7 verse 9. But in grasping and holding onto that and really holding onto it, you have to let go. You have to let go of your advantage. You have to let go of your comfort zone. You have to let go of, and the list goes on. But you have to start letting go of something. What do you need to let go of? Do you want that bright future? Is the future bright? How can you tell? And what are you doing to ensure that brightness becomes a reality? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's uh, another very powerful presentation from the heart. Thank you very much, Rosemary. That's very helpful. Um, we already have uh, a set of questions in the chat. Um, so, Andrew, would you like me to read that or would you like to read it yourself? Yes, Andrew. Why don't you just read it for me, Karenza? Okay, Andrew, I will do that. Discussion point. Thank you. Um, okay, so mm. Rosemary, I'm sure you can see it in the chat, but I'll read it anyway for those who okay. are listening at a podcast version after this. <laughs> okay, I'll just find it. Hold on a second. So, sorry, Eileen just jumped in there with the next question. <laughs> surely, surely there's no problem with heaven being filled, populated with my advantages. Do I really need to have to apologize for them? Mm -hmm. What is important is to work so that everyone, as far as I can make it possible, can share these advantages and opportunities. The problem surely is if I think or act as though my advantages make me superior person or that I want to protect them or keep them to myself. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. When you realize, when you recognize that your advantages hinder the journey of somebody else, because not everybody, not everybody recognizes that. Not everybody recognizes the 
opportunities and the advantages that were um, given to them, uh, or even that they were even given to them. They don't, there are so many people who don't recognize that. And one of the privileges of my work and my role is that I get to hear those stories. I get to hear the stories of people who suddenly recognize that the advantages that they have had have not entirely been by them pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, for example. And I always have time for people who number one, recognize it, and number two, ask themselves, how can I use this advantage to clear the way for someone else? How can I use my position, my power, my advantages to create a platform for someone who needs to speak or who needs to be seen? How can I use these and in these spaces? I said, I uh, talked earlier about being part of the seeing the face of God in each other team. And we delivered that always as a team. And we were not allowed to do it on our own. And I used to think, oh, but I've been doing it on my own for how many years? I'm okay. I can, got broad shoulders, thick skin ish. I can, I can handle it. But there was such wisdom in that. So our team was always a mixture of men and women, multi generational, black, brown, white. And the course had a progressive uh, mode to it. So we started off with the sort of simplies, the, the, um, the, the terms and words and definitions and things like that. Um, there's only one race, the human race and, and those we started off there. But then when we got to breaking down terms and getting people to work on the thing of this word racism, I never did that session, neither did any of the other black people in our session do that, do that, lead that session. It was always the white person in our group. Why was that? Because the people that we were speaking to were largely white. And our experience and observation shows that when it comes to the, now we're going to talk about racism and the definition, folk immediately, when they realized it wasn't going to be me and it wasn't going to be Heather, it was going to be, it was going to be Matthew, 60 something year old man, uh, former CEO stepping up doing that, immediately all eyes were on him. Everyone was present and aware. Why? Because they were used to hearing about racism and what racism is and all that. They were used to hearing that from someone who looks like me. They were not used to being confronted and challenged and, and stretched by somebody who looked like them, who grew up in their kind of neighborhoods, who went to the same kinds of universities. And that was transformational because even whether they liked it or not for that, in that what it did was create a space where folk could hear from their own about what they needed to hear. And it generated so much more uh, di dynamic conversations. And also he was able to for want of a better word, speak their lingo. <laughs> you know, sometimes you have to be multilingual. And if you don't, if you can't speak the language, get someone else in who can. And, you know, the famous quote of, you know, England and America being divided by the same language is very true. 
But I also learned that I had an advantage in that space. My advantage was that I was a black woman from England. And the minute I opened my voice, all eyes. And so I used that to talk about the American political, socio-political dynamics that have created and infiltrated church life in America. And it transformed the space. It was, my colleagues say, it was always a very different conversation. And it's just something about the fact that I am black, but I sound different. I'm the exotic other in that sense. You look the same, but you're not quite the same. And I'm, while I'm trying to work out, I'm going to be listening to what you're saying. But by that time, I've said what I've had to say. I've dropped the seed, I've stepped away. And what was that? So it's about identifying and knowing what your advantage is and how you use it. Advantage in and of itself is not a bad thing. How you recognizing it, recognizing the power of it and using it and utilizing it to the benefit, growth and betterment of people who do not share that advantage, that's the trick. I hope that um, answers the question, Andrew, in a way that makes sense. Oh, that's a good answer. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would sort of comment, sort of obviously, this journey that I'm certainly on, and I expect most of the people in the room are, is uh, at least partly towards a better self-knowledge, better understanding of ourselves, isn't it, really? Bless you. Yeah. And you're in the room, Andrew, and many aren't. And that's not to say that busy people are in any way being negated by this, but you know, you're spending an hour and a half of your evening to, to be in the space. And you did last week. So thank you very much for that. Thank um, you. Rosemary and uh, Graham Young did make a comment, which you've already echoed about uh, how you define privilege and how uh, advantage can be socially set and quite often unearned and I think that's a really worthwhile comment to have a look at advantages mm. often called privilege is societally granted unearned advantages accorded to some people and not others mm. and you illustrated that by your comment about being in the US and being listened to and mm. anybody any of the clergy in the room who've tried to say something to their parish and then the archdeacon walks in and says it and you've been I've been saying that for ages we'll know how that yeah how that feels <laughs> What is that? <laughs> what is that? You know. Um, yeah, but, got... but likewise, women in women in in particular um, in particular situations and business situations. Um, I have a friend of mine who who grinds her teeth in in frustration. Would say that she she'd be in a in a board an executive board meeting and she would say something, and people would sort of mm, and, and and write it down, and then the person further on down the table who's junior to her, maybe even part of her team, would say exactly the same thing. And it'd be like, oh, yes, of course. Yes, yeah, the, the, the energy in the room, she'd be like, wait, hang on, did I just step off into the twilight zone? What just happened here? And if there's any doubt about that reality, actually someone in the room was telling me that this has happened to them this week, several times who's in this space. So this is not something that's not understood. The, um, the, the trendy word, intersectionality, the, the crossing over of the different categories of privilege, mm. your, your sex, your education, your money, all those things conflate on each other. And we could actually probably, it, it, we, I don't want us to do this, but it'd be an interesting exercise to screenshot all of our pictures and then mm. get those organized in terms of who has most privilege to least privileged in this space. Mm because we could organize that right away. Mm. So we're all privileged, but even in this space, that would mm. be, that would be an, a, a revealing thing to do. I'd like to bring Jane in because she's got a really interesting comment. Jane, can I bring you in and you can speak for yourself, please? Um, um, Rosemary, thank you very, I can't see you on my screen at the moment, but thank you. Very <laughs> <much>. <laughs> I, can see, I can see your glasses. <laughs> you need to change the view or something. Um, Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. I was fascinated by what you by what you said about the impact that the art of the white male Jesus um, had on you and other people growing up with you. Mm. Um, and I wondered 
what your comments would be on how we should use or interact with art that exists already and is already in our churches. I mean, this is mm. this is something which is problematic in so many different contexts. Um, it I, and people respond to this sort of thing in so many different ways. Um, but mm. can it can preserve good things that the congregation has lost. It can also preserve bad things that the congregation wants to lose. And it, mm. it can have formative effects, as you said, which can be unquestioned, but then it can, I don't know. I mean, there are a whole lot of different ways of interacting with this and answering it. And I wondered what you would say. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a varied one, isn't it? Um, personally, I'm all about context and I'm all about people being willing to tell their stories. One of the things that doesn't happen in our church life together, and I wonder, I wonder if this is a, a Brit cultural thing, I don't know, but we don't talk about the things that we feel that think, we assume everyone already knows. We don't talk about, um, the context of our history. Now, for some, some times that's actually, a, I can understand that. It's uncomfortable, it's hard to reconcile with who you identify yourself to be right now and, and so on and so forth. But I did, I did art, I did art O-level back in the days when you did O-levels. And I did, a, and I did a, um, a, an art course. It was more of a, um, um, an auditing of a course. I didn't, didn't take any exams, but it was just really interesting to me that it raised something that I hadn't really thought of. If you are an artist and you want to paint a picture of a, of a, of a man and You, you want to, you need a subject, your subject to someone to use as a model, you will choose the, the people that are around you. And that's what we see in a lot of our church arts, especially some of the stuff in, if you've, if you've had an opportunity to go to Italy and, and Florence and, and Rome, you see, you see these, these paintings of, of these people and very often those faces are faces of people that the artist would see every day. If you go to, um, if you go to Japan or China, where there is religious artwork there, very often the people look like the people in that nation. One of the things that we, is particular to us and our history is that we went out, picked up stuff, brought it back, took stuff out. You know, the sun never set on our, on our empire. And that has an impact in terms of what and where, where you are perceived as the conqueror. You get to say what is and what isn't, what's normal, what's not normal, what's right, what isn't right. And for a long time, that was the case. So we see a lot of this artwork that represents not just the artist's worldview, but also the, the worldview of what was the known world then. Fast forward to more recent times, we have over the past century or so, access to so much more different types of art, different types of interpretation. I don't know, does anyone remember, I think it might be CMS, that had a, had a resource called The Christ We Serve? Does anyone, does that, does that build, and it had, oh, thanks, I, I didn't imagine it. And it had um, images of Christ from around the world. And the imagery that was used was extraordinary. So there was one of a Maasai warrior and the Maasai warrior had all the regalia of a firstborn son. It's very masculine painting, um, you know, 
obviously very handsome, um, but serious and uh, and with all the regalia of a firstborn son. Now, to me, just looking at it, it's just a, a Maasai warrior with beads, but the beads and the way that they were arranged indicate, oh, Paul, have you got it? Paul's got it. Oh my gosh, bless you. <laughs> we've also got uh, we've also got I think five sets of the Christ we serve and multiple other sets in the resource center Rosemary all available to people here. Oh, brilliant! And yes, that's it, Jan. Could you hold it up again? Yes. And some I did a I I I like to go to various courses and 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 things like you know to talk about theology and and how we see and how how we see God and how we speak about things of God in our modern day. And somebody explained in that course that it, having Jesus the way he is portrayed in what we know in, in Western Europe would make no sense because there's no, in, in, in for, for the Maasai, because they don't understand that. Firstborn son, you show the picture of Jesus, the only son of God, how do you know? Where, where's, how do you know? that he's the only son of God? Where is the indication that he is the firstborn son? He could be anybody. But that picture, very clearly, that this is the firstborn son. And there was another one, um, I think from Latin America, I can't remember which Latin America country, where it had Jesus looking right at you and pointing in your face, like really, up in your face and and was yeah looked like Che Guevara and and that was that in the with all the upheaval and the, the turmoil that has been very prevalent in Latin America that picture of Jesus that confrontational you need to pull yourself together this is wrong really resonated and to me personally that's my kind of Jesus, that one there, the guy that goes in and turns up and up into people's faces. That's my kind of guy. So when I think of Jesus, that's the Jesus I think of. That's the guy that I, that's, that's the person I follow. Um, and it was just very interesting to me when I used it in different settings, how people responded to those various images. Because the fact of the matter is, those images resonate, all of those images resonate with us on one level or another, depending on how we came to faith, who we understand God to be, our socio-political standpoint, whether we more aim towards something that's more peaceful and conciliatory, or if you like a hellraiser like me, <laughs> you know, um, you know it's, it's, it, it depends on who, on where you are, but there are facets of that that resonate with all of us so the most more art we see the more opportunity that we get to see people's interpretations the better and also to get a sense of um that not one is better than the other but it is just an image we don't we can only guess at what christ looks like we have a broad brushstroke outline, but we can only guess. But we have a we have a sense of aspects and facets of his personality in the Bible. And one of the wonderful things about art is that artists can interpret that for give visual visualization to those facets. So if we were to get all those images and wash them together, we'd probably get the closest we'd ever get. To, to Christ, but it's a, but to talk about it and to be open about it and, um, and to put the art that we have in our churches in context and, and talk about that and allow people's frustrations and lack of knowledge to raise so that you can talk about that too and maybe fill in the gaps for yourself and maybe even for them is really important. Don't be afraid of the conversation. Thank you. Right, that's very, very 
helpful question. Has anybody else got a question they'd like to ask before I basically follow on from the stuff that Rosemary's just said about how we can resource better? Uh, I'm not going to go on and on about this because um, <laughs> we don't have time, but we've got another question. Graham has saved you from me. I will tell you, you will hear from me, but first I want to hear from Graham. Graham, jump in. Where are you, Graham? Uh, thanks, Karenza. And I, I've written the question out there that Rosemary can probably see. I mean, the, there's yeah. a, a well-known cycle that uh, yes. people go through uh, who are brought into organisations to deal with uh, racism, anti-racism, or the dismantling of racism within an organisation, mm. where they, they go through a honeymoon period, they're welcomed, they people say they want to hear what they've got to say yada, yada, and then yada, yeah. the organization mm -hmm. um, has some of the problems reflected back to it by that person of color um, and then all of a sudden the organization starts to kick back a bit and react and then the person of color you know becomes to be seen as a bit of a problem and uh, they become the problem yeah. Uh, and they often end up back outside the organisation quite quickly. Yeah, very quickly. Um, and I just wonder whether the church is, uh, is doing this, um, whether we are bringing people of colour, putting them at the head of organisation or committees that are supposed to be dealing with this, mm. when this is a white person's problem. Mm. And white people need to listen to people of colour, but they mm. need to sort their own problems out. Mm. Wow. Can I shrink you and bring you with me? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're keeping him. Get your hands off. Oh, God. Oh. Until lockdown. Hey, Graham, till lockdown. <laughs> till it's lifted. Um, yeah. So I got a lot of this, as you can imagine, um, after, during 2020, where people wanted me to come and talk to them um, and to be fair I'm not going to lie in the beginning of my career the late 80s early 90s that was that was like my call to action and I'd writing we'd go through all these pieces of work and there'd be the there'd be the tears and the woe is me the sackcloth is sackcloth and ashes and then when it came to put this thing on the road it was like oh but 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 uh, and, and you know it's happening too fast and with this we don't with that with everyone's going to be comfortable and so on and so forth so I stopped doing it I stopped doing it when I was in the states and the reason that I stopped doing it was I need to see your receipts I need to see where what what your level of understanding is and what work you've already done and what your aims and objectives are and how you intend to implement your aims and objectives. You say, well, we don't know what our aims and objectives are until we've done the, the, the that, excuse my French, is BS. It is rubbish. If you do not think if you're not even thinking about what it is you want to see changing in your organization, if you're not even asking that question, and if you are willing to do whatever it takes to get there, if you haven't had those conversations, then when you bring somebody in to facilitate conversations and get people to tell their stories, it is nothing but pure, unadulterated wickedness. Because you are pulling pe getting people to share their trauma for nothing but your entertainment, because you have no intention of doing anything with it, because you haven't even started doing the work for yourself. And then someone's gone in, they've spent their time, effort, energy, exposed their emotional trauma, and Everyone's going, oh, that's not terrible. Isn't that horrible? And everyone then goes home, but then nothing happens. And that person is shredded. Sharing those stories is very exhausting. I don't do it. So, and I, I now have resources to sort of be that canary 
in, in, in the mine. Um, and I send organizations that canary. They don't know it's a canary. And then when I ask them about it, if they can answer my questions, then we can start having a conversation. But if they can't, I know they've not engaged. So I said, I don't think that this is worth your time or mine. And I walk away. Intentionality, it's very powerful and it's a very good canary. Thank you for that, that was really helpful. Uh, at this point, I'd like to bring Remy in. Um, is someone who can speak for himself, Remy? Thank you. Uh, I, th I think what's being raised is something that I've found also quite irritating, especially being part of the NHS. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, especially in meetings, I've always found that people are invited to share their stories, you know, stories of pain. Mm -hmm. And I've been very clear in emphasizing that people are wounded. Uh, that all we do is invite people to be wounded again and again. Mm. And the big problem is the system never changes. And it's equally putting people in positions that does nothing if that person is not allowed to influence things. Mm. Most people would refer to that as being able to co-create and we see a lot of that in our society and in institutions. And I think that's something we need to be very vocal about. And I'll use myself as an example. If I'm offered anything, I make sure I say what I think that post should be or what that thing should actually be, because I don't feel I should always fit in to what is expected. Mm. And that's how I deal with those things. And I encourage other people to do those things and just keep being vocal about it. But while I'm actually on, I want to comment on privilege and things like that. I was looking at an article earlier on and on the day of the murder of George Floyd, there was another incident in Central Park. Mm -hmm. That incident was of a lady, a white lady, who was in a confrontation with a black gentleman. All he had asked her to do was to put her dog back on the leash. What did she do? She mm -hmm. said to him, I will phone the police and tell them that an African-American is threatening me and my dog. This gentleman recorded this conversation. What was she actually doing? She felt she was in a position of privilege. And so she acted out that privilege, but she acted out that privilege to a structure, which was the police, who feel they are to preserve something and they were to enforce something to an individual to remind him that he doesn't belong and needs to be put in his place. And I thought I'll just give that slant around privilege where it's deep down in an historical context. And when you read back the history people of colour have always been told they need to subscribe to what is expected of them. Mm -hmm. So how dare this African-American tell this lady to put the leash on her dog? He shouldn't have the audacity to do that. Mm -hmm. And we keep seeing that recycled again and again. And for those of you who are here and those who can't be here, I think it's really positive because what we're able to do is to inform ourselves, to get an understanding of these things. So when the moment comes, we can challenge those people who do not know those things. It irritates me when people say, well, but they're only a minority. 
well, what are the majority doing? Mm. Those minority for me are just ignorant and they need to be informed, not in an aggressive way, but what we're doing here today is learning. I'm learning so that I can inform. I think I'll stop there so I can now Karenza to, you know, give her a bit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Andrew's, uh, thank you, Remy. Andrew's just noted in the clip that um, he said, didn't the police quickly realise that she was wasting their time? Mm. That really isn't the point. The point is that she thought she could use that as a weapon. And mm. the other point is that the police didn't come uh, with a gun and shoot her. Mm. Because she was a white woman. So why would you do that? They so came with weapons drawn. Yeah, exactly. It's an institutional, it's an inst she wasn't shot. And, you know, and if, if someone reports a white in those situations, uh, white people are a tiny percentage of those who get shot without even being uh, ad addressed those issues. Uh, do you think a, what we, sorry, Rosemary? So there, there is, there is a, um, an issue here that I think very often it's easy for us to sit here and look over at America, mm -hmm. go tish tish, and not pay attention to the stuff that's happening right here on, at, on our watch. What, Stephen Lawrence and the lack of convictions, for example? The, Stephen, I saw a video, some of you might have seen it, of a, 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 a performance poet who was talking, who did a poem in response to George Floyd and made reference to the Stephen Lawrence murder. He said when, in, in there, if I can find the, if I can find it, I'll, I'll, forward it but if you listen to it he said when Stephen Lawrence was murdered I was three and when his murderers were convicted I was 24. So if anyone here can can show a comparison of a young person who is murdered and the murderers known to the police and it take two decades for a conviction, I would love to hear that case. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. People being beaten, people being arrested by the police and then and being taken away, probably yelling and, and screaming, but, but submitting to being arrested and then ending up in intensive care. I think one of the things that's come up in the chat, Rosemary, is a really important point. Um, and actually the Resource Centre has been working very hard over the last two years to try and address this with the RE curriculum. But Angela says, what is taught in British schools is the American civil rights movement and not the Brixton riots. Hey, that's and true. I, now I lived in the, I lived in the, I'm the same age as you, Rosemary, and I was a university student who lived in Brixton during the Brixton riots, um, mm. which was an interesting experience for me. Me too. <laughs> yeah, well, we live near, must be near each other. We're neighbours. Um, and, um, one of the things that we know is that the school's curriculum is institutionally racist. Mm. When you learn a modern foreign language, you do not learn to talk about the spirit, the dreams, the aspirations, the love life of the people around you. You learn how to go in, get on their bus, go and buy their stuff and be transactional. Mm. It's the language of an oppressor. And we know that from a whole range of other subjects in history and mm. in RE. Um, we don't acknowledge the non-European origins of maths there's a whole range of stuff that's happening in our schools people in our schools yeah now there is actually a very large movement that's coming from postgraduate areas to help decolonize that's the trendy word the curriculum it's going mm. to be a really long time but unless people are actually aware of the contextualization of that and where that's coming from we're not going to be able to look at it and what we're all doing in this room is asking questions mm. asking and questions. that's the important thing the asking questions and if you have any influence in any school, even if it's just picking up, even if it's picking up or dropping off kids, ask the question, why, if it's Black History Month in the UK, why are we learning about Americans? Nothing against Americans, but there are black people in this country that transformed this country. You talk about the bus strikes and the, and the bus boycotts, no one, is hearing about the bus boycotts in Brist Bristol that brought the city to a standstill. You know, when we talk about um, uh, 
our, our first our first black police officers, our first black head teacher who's recently died, um, uh, people who came to this country with the intention of contributing to what they felt was just an extension of their own country. <laughs> they, they, well, they didn't immigrate, they migrated, just much like Carenza left South London and went, and went up north, she just migrated, okay? Basically, that was it. You could never call my parents immigrants, they would have you. They would have you, all niceness will just get dropped because as far as they were concerned, they were British moving to the mainland. They were not immigrants. And so this whole thing about the Windrush, um, the Windrush scandal, it's not just a scandal, it's a complete and utter outrage. When you bring people, my dad would say, you can deport me anytime you want, but you need to give me back every single penny I paid in taxes while I was here. But that's not happening. And people are, people, when they get sent back to their countries, I don't know what happens in other countries, but the Jamaican High Commissioner told me that for those people who got deported to Jamaica, they were basically shunned because no, if, because their idea was if you've been deported from England, you must have done something wrong. Because England, we're supposed to be fair. Don't know if you got that memo, but we're supposed to be fair people and do the right thing. So if someone gets deported from this country back to the country they left, they must have done something wrong. And people were shunned. And people died never seeing the rest of their family again. Shame is a, is a killer. And there are people who literally died of shame on our watch. On our watch, people, on our watch. Are we our brother and sister's keeper? Does the evidence show up? Does the evidence show that? I put some of the um, summaries of some of the questions that you were asking as we went along into the chat, Rosemary, which will be sent out uh, to people if they would like it after this recording. So they can they can watch the recording again and they can also look at those questions. Um, and there's so many things that you've brought up that are really hard hitting. But certainly one of the things I think we can do is we can all stand beside Remy. Because mm -hmm. if Graham's point is right, which it is, then we do not make Remy the voice of this movement. We are this movement in Durham Diocese. This is our job in the Northeast. It's what we do. Uh, we listen to his experience and he is leading us because he's having conversations which help us discern a path. But this isn't his job. This is our job. So I really hope that we can work with that. We are running out of time and we have uh, 10 minutes left and we're going to end with Remy. Um, so I would like to do my bit now. And my bit is reasonably quick because I can do this at any point. But for those of you that don't know me in my professional context as the director of the Resources Centre, which is based in um, Cuthbert House in Durham and in Church House in North Shields, you may not know we've got 38,000 resources which you can borrow. And many of those, because I've been in my job for 27 years and when you're a student at 19 in the middle of Brixton riots, you do think quite carefully about how you deal with people of other races and cultures are designed to try and help you think through what you might want to do in your own context in, in Durham churches. So we will be doing a variety of things that are coming up. Um, what we do have are those images that Rosemary talked about in the Christ that we share and a whole range of others, boxes and boxes and boxes actually of images of the person of Jesus in from varieties of cultures. We have resources online that are catalogued because we catalog stuff that's available online so you can search it. You don't have to necessarily borrow if you're in the middle of lockdown. We have hunger cloths, Lenten veils from all around the world. And if you're interested in them particularly, I run workshops on those. I've run four workshops during uh, the entire three sets of lockdowns that we've been under. So you can do those with your own parishes. And they look at the experience of um, other nations, people of colour, black, brown, a whole variety, um, like Eileen was saying last week, also uh, mm -hmm. Chinese and other places. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about colour, um, which we can work on, and I can help you unpack some of those and build some images. If you are looking at Bible study, 
are you actually looking at the fact that this comes from a Middle Eastern context? Are you thinking about not just the person of Jesus as a person of color, but the prophets? Are you thinking, when you use the words Babylon and Nineveh, have you got a clue where they are? Have you actually thought about what the cultural contexts of those are? Are you thinking about the global nature of this faith? Mm. When you think about what a Christian looks like, are you thinking about a black woman? between 24 and 34 is that the image you're giving your congregation and your kids because they're the majority in the world mm. that's who the majority christian is that's what they look like we will be um looking at a whole range of other resources that i can give you and i'm not here to bash anybody because the reality is i know loads of you in this room already because you use this stuff you know Roz in her college setting and Alison in her parish setting and Andrew I've known for many years there's a whole range of you Michael who I know users and have these resources but you might not have thought about them in this particular context and I'd like you to my sister was a children's librarian she rang me up and said do you know in 2017 only three percent of all the fiction published in the UK had a child of colour in it that's it so some regions of our country have 50%, 60%, 70% children of colour, and yet not one of the children's fiction books that they're offered has someone like them in it. We have now two boxes of resources that you can pick up and borrow and take away for your children's workers, for your adults, for anyone who wants to look at the Lord's Prayer, Psalm, whatever, all with children of colour in there. Our kids are used to multicultural life. They see it on CBBS. Look it up. Nickelodeon they they see this stuff on the telly and then they walk out of real life and they may not see it at all in their own church in their own context or in their own school so we can maybe help with some of that Rosemary's holding something yeah oh sorry I'm all hooked up on this hang on <laughs> no I I in a in a previous life as the young wife of a new minister I was given the responsibility of doing and don't be shocked Sunday school deep joy Anyway, so um, what, what, what was a, uh, a challenge to me was that the work that we had, the stuff that we used for our kids who were all black, apart yeah. from one white family who had small kids, um, that the, the scripture union resources did not reflect them. Most of them would have come from um, uh, either Nigeria or Ghana, there'd be so few food from, uh, from the Caribbean. And so I went hunting and I don't know if this is still available, but I found this resource written by Anthony Reddy. And I believe there's been nothing like it since, which is growing into hope. One and two. And very quickly, the impact of this can be shown in we the first thing we did was to. I put up a big map of the um, of the of of Bible of Bible Land. We just called it Bible Land, where all the main stories that we were going to be looking at. And I said, "Where is this?" And they looked at it, and they looked at it, and they it was all America, <laughs> Australia. Their kids, bless them. Um, that's where your taxpayers' money is going. Education. Um, and then I overlaid it with the map of Africa. So it just kind of pulled it back and it had so sort of North Africa, that Middle East, that area. And then the minute I put the outline of Africa and interposed it on that, one guy said, but that's where Nigeria is. He recognized where Nigeria was on the map. And he said, so, Jesus just lived up there. And I said, yeah, he did. And transformed the interaction of those kids. This is about some place where my people actually lived as well. I, I'll never forget that for as long as I live. And I don't know if this is still available, but out of my cold hands, all these, um, it's just, if you can get hold of it. I'll ask Anthony, I'll ask him. Uh, if I can have a couple of sets of it, so that would be. If you can, um, yeah, yeah, or no, even the that. publishers. I don't know who the publisher. He might have something in his cupboard. He's got a very big office. We could ask him to. <laughs> yeah. I, if I want it, I'll find a way of getting it. I'm sure I will. Meth somehow. The Methodist Church. It was. It was. Yeah. Published by the Methodist Church. So, but yes, absolutely I mean, I, brilliant resource, and there's nothing else like it. No one has ever 
produced anything else in all that time. And this is 19, this was in the 19, 1998. Mm -hmm. that and that speaks to publishers. Anything like this was ever published. And publishers publish where there's money. So, yeah. you know, put your money where your mouth is. Let's ask for this kind of stuff. I'll certainly chase that up. Okay. Um, the other thing I would say to you, everybody, is that if you want some ideal times to start looking at this, Pentecost is one. If you want a really good reason to look at the spread of the church and where the church comes from and what its origins look like and who's talking with whom, there's a whole, Pentecost is a great resource for mm. messing around with that. And we've got story bags and we've got godly play sets. We've got lots of stuff. So what I would say to all of you is it's, we, we are not experts in this. I am finding my way and we are redoing a load of our resources because I think they're now rubbish. Stuff that I defended 10 years ago, I want to get rid of. Um, <laughs> so no, seriously, we're, we're working, we're reworking a whole load of resources because I, my, my own education is, is changing and my view is changing, but we will be there to help you. The resource center has some really good colleagues. Um, we're in lockdown right now. So all you can do is email us, but we will be opening on March the 8th again, and we'll be available to all of you to come in and out. Uh, that's providing roadmaps where open viruses are, are behaving themselves. That's excellent, Jonathan. I will certainly have a look at that. And uh, But I want Anthony to give it to me. But I will certainly chase it up, Jonathan. Thank you. And thank you, Angela. That's really kind. Um, I'm now going to end by handing over to Remy. I'd like to thank everybody in the space. I'd like to thank you for your questions. I'd love to privilege it's a privilege to have got to know rosemary in part over the last few months and uh, now i've got a phone number she ain't been anywhere um remy can i hand it over to you please okay thank you uh, a huge thank you to both rosemary and carenza for their input but everyone else because it was a conversation and combining both their roles as vocations and resource the question i would like to leave you with is what is our vocation as a church? What is our vocation as a people of God? And that's something I would really like us to go away with and deeply think about it, but also the questions that you've all raised. This is not the end. This is the beginning of conversation. So please keep carrying on this conversation and for next week we will be having which hopefully most of you are aware Christine Christine Moneza will be speaking to us on unconscious bias so letting our guard down addressing our unconscious biases so that's something you know we look forward to but we also have someone from Bristol Mark Nam, who will also be giving us something about his own story. I've met him, very inspirational, and you would have hopefully noticed by now, we try to bring in a local speaker, but also someone from outside the diocese. So I wish you all well, and thank you so much. And we will conclude with the usual prayer, which I think we have. And I would like us to just really say this with thought. I mean, so let us, yes. Can I just, it's just something um, that, that reminded me, and I just want to sort of try and end with it. I don't know whether people can see it. Um, it's a really, it's something that, ha that hangs on my um, whiteboard thing next to my desk. Um, yeah. It's, you know, all these colouring sheets that you get when, when you're doing Sunday schools and stuff. Mm -hmm. And this was from a kid a number of years ago, a child of about 13, who pointed out that none of the colouring bits that they get ever reflect anything about their um, their colour or, or whatever. Um, and so he, he coloured, she coloured this in, in, and you can you can't really see it, but the the vicar's green, the baby's blue, mm -hmm. and this this one here is sort of pink. And they've just written, "Jesus loves you anyway, whether you're green, blue, pink, or question mark." And I think that was just a slight act of rebellion by a child or a teenager, and it was just an awareness that we give out things and we just don't think. And and I hadn't thought until they did that and thought, yeah, I hand out loads of colouring sheets with nobody of any other color but mm -hmm. yeah so that it was just it was just a it's funny but it's it's really heart-wrenching as well well i think it's an important point joanne that you raise in terms of the voice of a child 
because when people are suppressed, they will speak out. And even a child can at times feel they're being suppressed and they will speak out. So I think it's an important point that you raise, but it's also important for our levels of consciousness, which is what today is all about, to improve and increase our levels of consciousness, but at the same time, learning to confront self. That's the important thing. Let us pray. So a prayer for peace and justice. Grant us, Lord, a vision of your world as you would have it. A world where peace is built with justice and where justice is guided by love. May we know your compassion for all who suffer and your courage in challenging complacency. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so Carenza will let you all out and some of us with the speakers will remain behind. But thank you so much. Have a pleasant week ahead and look forward to seeing you next week. Keep the questions coming. Thank you.